How many of you pray? You think? How many of you pray? Yeah, good to see. <laughs> Don't want to just embarrass the children. The um, what do you pr- what can you pray for? Do you think? What? That God will help us. Yep. Anything else? No. Adults, what do, what do we pray for? Friends and family, yep. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> Any, there? Any else? We can give thanks, yep. We can pray lots, for lots of things, can't we? Everything about us, about our lives, we can pray for. All right? Because, one, there's nothing that, about us that God doesn't know. And two... For a strange reason, he's decided that he cares for us. And it's a strange reason simply because we don't deserve it. We don't deserve to have him care for us. But what's great is the fact that he chooses to do that. Okay, where can we pray? Pray. We can pray anywhere. Anywhere? Like where's anywhere? Can you tell me some actual places where we can pray? You know? At home, yep. Adults, sorry? Here, yep. In the car, somebody said. Where else? At work. If you're an astronaut and there are some up, up in the space lab, can you pray there? Yep. Um, where else can you pray? Where's, what do you think is the strangest place you can think of to pray? Bathroom? Why is that strange? Um, what could be the strangest? Well, in the um, passage today that we're, we're looking at, we meet what I think is probably the strangest place to pray. We have Jonah praying in the middle of a fish. Now, I'm not really that keen on wanting to try, try and do that, emulate Jonah. I'm not, I like my sushi... From the outside, not from the inside. And so, but that's got to be a kind of a strange place to pray, don't you think? And yet, God heard him. And if God would hear a man praying in a fish, do you think there's anywhere that God could not hear you praying? And so, we can be encouraged that God will always hear us. No matter where we are, and in Jonah's case, he was, he was absolutely wrong. So no matter how bad we are, God will always hear us. How he answers is his, pro- is his uh, choice, but he will always hear us. So let's just have a quick prayer before we go back. Our gracious Father, we thank you for your mercy. We pray, O Lord, that you would have your hand upon these, our Covenant children, that you would watch over them, that you would strengthen them, that you would fill them with your spirit, that you would encourage them in the, uh, with the means of grace, that they may study your word, that they may learn it, that they may fellowship with your people, and that they may encourage one another. We thank you for this, O oh Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles to the book of Jonah. In chapter 2, found on uh, page 726 of the uh, Church Bibles. Before we uh, read it, let us just ask the Holy Spirit to help us understand his word. Let us pray. Oh Lord God, Holy Spirit, we thank you that you have caused men to record these words before us, that you have endeavored to Uh, preserve them for us. And so we pray that you would fill our minds, that you would open our hearts as we read the Word of God, that you would help us to understand, that you would help us to learn, that you would teach us, 
that you would rebuke us, that you would strengthen us, encourage us, that you would train us. That as we read and as we put this word into practice, that we may become more and more like the Lord Jesus who lived it, the word of God here on earth. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Jonah chapter 2, from verse 1, reading from the ESV. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I, I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and flood, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall li- again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my he- about my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought, my, brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who pray regard vain idols, forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with a voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Amen. Most people limit the, uh, the story of Jonah to the big fish. You just look at most children's books about Jonah. Many of the titles are Jonah and the Big Fish or Jonah and the Whale. Ask people about Jonah and uh, most times they just mention the fish. Yet the story of Jonah is not about the fish, not about the size of it or what kind it might be or how could he possibly have been swallowed up and still breathing for three days. All those sort of Wonderful questions that we like to ask, but it's not important for the story. The fish is just a, just mentioned. doesn't really explain much about it. It just happens to be there. It has an important role in the stories, simply to transport Jonah from where he was, running away from God, to where he was supposed to go. Towards Tarshish, uh, sorry, towards Nineveh, from Tarshish towards Nineveh. That's all the, the fish is about. It's just a means of transport. And probably a lot faster means than what than boat of the day was. I mean, if you look at the map, he's out somewhere near, heading towards Spain somewhere, and he's turned around in three in less than three days. He spat out on a beach somewhere near, near uh, Nineveh, way out on the other side of the, the Mediterranean. But it's a, although it's an important role, it's a minor role. It's the minor character in the story. But what we are to learn and to uh, gain from the passage is that You and I are to repent and obey God. We're to repent and to obey God. We're to come to God and and ask for forgiveness. Now Jonah was tossed into the sea because he wanted to die rather than to help God um, bring the Ninevites to repentance. That's what comes out of chapter 1. That's what we're introduced to. We're told when in the midst of the storm, and he's asked, what shall we do in order to uh, appease God, the God who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and, the, and all the land? And instead of asking for telling him that he has to repent, he tells him he wants to die. He tells him to throw me overboard into the sea. Now, Jonah's, Jonah comes from shepherd country. He doesn't come from the seaside. The Jews weren't all that very good at, at uh, 
sailing and, and ships and things by his, around his age, his stage. The sea was a, was a terrible place, a place full of danger. So the odds of him being able to swim, let alone in the midst of the storm, were pretty slim. And he's also not an idiot. He knew what would happen to him if he got tossed overboard, that he would drown. And that's what he wanted. He wanted to die. But the thing is that God had other ideas. You know, sometimes we want to do, there's lots of things sometimes we want to do. I don't know about you, but there's lots of things I sometimes want to do. But God seems to have other ideas. I'd like to win lotto, but I don't want to buy a ticket. <laughs> and so far, God hasn't had the idea to give me one either. But Jonah wants to, wants to die, but God has his other ideas. And, and uh, the reality is that it's God who's in control of history. One of the, one of the things that always bugs me when I'm listening to the, watching the rugby or something and we, see, we hear the commentator go, it's history in the making. Everything is history in the making. This is history in the making. And just living is history in the making. But God is the one who's in control of history. And as one uh, bright fellow pointed out, history really means his story. The history of the world isn't just, don't just look at church history. All of history is his story. All of it is about what he is doing and how he is leading and dragging us to the end point where he wants us to be. Because it is he who causes things to happen and he did not want Jonah to die so soon. Yes, Jonah was going to die. It was just not at that point. And we obviously know that Jonah died because he's not around now. How many interviews would he be having about what was it like inside the fish? So God creates this great fish to uh, keep Jonah alive. Jonah wanted to die, but he must have been terrified when a great fish comes and gulps him down. There are times when you and I, you and I will not listen to God unless he does something drastic to get our attention. The early church in Jerusalem, after the, before Jesus ascended, he tells them that, you will be my witnesses here in Jerusalem and in Samaria and in sorry in Judea and in Samaria until the ends of the earth. That sounds great. That's a great slogan, mission slogan. We usually use it and have it all printed up and everything else. It's really great. And so after Pentecost in Acts chapter two, we get get the uh, the coming in of three thousand. Converts, and then a few more days later, we have 5,000 uh, men who are converted, which essentially means 5,000 families. He's coming in, and so we have a quite a large church brewing there. The problem is, they seem to be very comfortable where they are because there's no moving into Judea or into Samaria or into the ends of the earth, it's all sitting around there. I mean, Jesus tells them that they're supposed to be his witnesses out. In these places, and they're all playing happy families in Jerusalem, or almost happy families. There's a little argy bargy in there, but they're basically happy to be there. And so God sends Saul to come and throw a few of them into, into prison. And suddenly, they're all spread out. Suddenly, they're traveling through Samaria here and, and preaching the gospel. They're moving out to the ends of the earth. We're told the Apostle Thomas ended up in India somewhere. Others moving out around, around the world, such to the point that eventually Christianity takes over the Roman Empire. But God had to give them an incentive to get out of, out of their, uh, their rut. And that's sometimes what we do. We're stuck. If we're not listening to God's will, then he will make us listen. Jonah wanted to die, but he didn't want to end up being fish food. But this experience brings Jonah back to his, to his senses. 
I can just imagine him trying to hold his breath or something or other when this, his mouth, this mouth closes over him. And it closes over him because he's, he's fully in one piece. He isn't bitten anywhere. He's able to walk through the streets of Nineveh or walk from the beach to Nineveh and then walk through it. So he's not bitten anywhere. He's swallowed it whole. And so when he discovers that he's, he's still alive, and uh, if you want to debate the um, science, science of that, go ahead. It's, it's beyond me. When we get to heaven, you might, might be interested in finding out, but I kind of doubt it. But he's alive, and he discovers that he's alive. He discovers that he's still breathing, and yet he's inside a big fish. And when he discovers that he's alive, he turns to God in prayer. He starts to pray. And this is what we have in chapter 2, his prayer. A miracle had taken, pla- had taken place, but it's not the miracle of the fish. It's the miracle of the change of heart in Jonah. He turns and prays he's to God. While he's in the midst, deepest depths of misery, Jonah finds mercy from God. Although Jonah had turned his back on God, he turned his back on God, he'd heard God tell him to go to Nineveh and he runs away to Tarshish. He gets told he's in the middle of the storm, he has a choice to, to repent and he says he wants to die instead. Although he is so he turns his back on God, and yet God doesn't turn his back on him. God has a plan for him to do something. And even his sin doesn't get in the way of God's plan. And so we have this prayer. And in this prayer, Jonah teaches us um, four things about prayer. Things that we should emulate. It's a good prayer for you and I to use as a model, especially for those times when we're in times of trouble and especially those times when we're in trouble because of our own bad choices, of our own bad decisions, of our own disobedience. And therefore, when we are in that sort of place, in that place we need to repent and we need to get back onto the right path. One of the, the first thing we find as we look through this prayer, we find that Jonah is brutally honest. You know, he talks about where he's at. He talks about it's his fault. And yet, he's honest in saying that salvation belongs to the Lord. It's unfortunate, but you and I aren't always honest in our prayers. I mean, it's stupid because we're talking to the one who knows everything. But we still try to, we still try to make it sound like it's not our fault. Because we don't like things to be our fault. We don't like to be the one who's, in, who's uh, to blame. And therefore, we come to God in prayer asking him to bless us not realizing that he is withholding his blessing because of our unconfessed sin. Sometimes you might want to complain that God, to God that you are suffering unjustly when in fact God has placed you in a position of suffering so that you may be encouraged to come to him in repentance. It is important to be honest in our prayers. As I said, after all, God knows everything, everything about you. He knows your every thought, even the, even the times when you are deluding yourself. He knows you like no one else does. And you cannot hide anything from him. So why bother? Why don't we just be honest to him? 
mainly because we don't want to be honest with ourselves if, at those times. There was a little girl who uh, went to her father and asked if she could go out and play here in the park. And when her father said no, she replied, well, what do you want me to do? And her father told her, and, but instead of obeying, she remained next to him. After a while, her mother came in, into the room and uh, asked her what she was doing. And the little girl told her mum that she was waiting for her father to tell her what to do. And at this, her father replied, no, you are not. I told you what to do. You're actually waiting to see if you can get me to change my mind. And it's unfortunate, but many of our prayers are actually attempts to get God to change his mind. Get God to let us do something that he has already forbidden, or already told us that we're not to do. And this leads us into trouble. And just like Adam and Eve, we are quick to lay the blame for our trouble at the feet of anyone but ourselves. Jonah acknowledges his troubles, and he acknowledges his source of his troubles. It was God who caused him his misery, but it was his fault. Jonah realizes that he is the blame for God punishing him. And more to the point, Jonah is penitent. That is, he is prepared to confess his sin and to be genuinely sorrowful. For his disobedience. One of the interesting things about this prayer is that Jonah doesn't ask God for anything. He doesn't try to bargain with God. There's no idea here of Jonah saying to God, Well, oh God, if you get me out of this mess, I'll be a good boy. I will do what you want me to do. I will go to church seven days a week. I will whatever bargain you want to make with God. You know, just usually you um, see good examples of that, that sort of uh, prayer on TV shows and things where the hero or whatever prays that if I get God will get me out of this, then I will do X, Y, I'll donate half my pay or whatever it is that they want to bargain. But our God doesn't bargain. How do you bargain with somebody who has everything? I mean, there's nothing. Don't let us fool ourselves. There is nothing you and I can give him that he hasn't already got. You say, oh, well, if you, if you get me out of this trouble, I will worship you. Well, he, for you, he's got millions and billions of other people who could worship him. He don't need you. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need us. What bargains do you think you can make? With somebody who already has everything. And yet we try to do that. We still try to do it. But Jonah, to his credit, doesn't. <clears throat> Jonah asked God for nothing except forgiveness because he knew he deserved all that he got and more besides. The third characteristic of Jonah's prayer is that for you and I to copy is that of thanksgiving. Here is Jonah in the belly of a huge fish, giving thanks. Now I was tempted when I realized this, I was tempted to think that he was a bit nuts. I mean, he's stuck in the middle of a of a fish. He knows nowhere where he is, where he's going. And, um, some commentators have postulated that the uh, Intestinal juices of the thing are actually eating his skin, which uh, could cause could be an explanation why he's so successful when he gets into Nineveh and starts preaching because he looks so terrible. Uh, may or may not. That's just a speculation. But what we do know is he's stuck in the fish. He doesn't know which way is north or which way is south or where he's going. He doesn't know if he's going to make it or how long he's going to be in there for. And yet, he gives thanks. In the midst of his trouble, in the midst of his, his uh, 
of his circumstances, he is able to be thankful despite his circumstances. He's able to be thankful because he has found the grace of God again. He's found that God is gracious to him. That God has not let him die in his rebellion. You know, just like Adam and Eve when they were kicked out of the garden, God stops them from living forever in their rebellion because he keeps them out of the garden with the seraphims and the flashing sword. Not to punish them, but to keep them from their own, from their own troubles. And this is what Jonah is thankful for. But what do you and I give thanks to God for? Do you give thanks for your health? It's good to do. For your wealth? Yeah, it's good to do. But how much do you give thanks to God? How much do you really appreciate the grace of God in your life? You know, there's a, a trite saying, a quaint, which is true. It says, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. And it's true. But when we're suffering, when we're hurting, we don't think he's being good. We like thinking of blessings as being things that are what we like is nice. You know? Things that we like, that's what a blessing is. And things that we don't like, well, that's when God's cursing us. Actually, the reverse is, is more likely to be true. And when times are going well, it's when God's judging us to see if we'll be faithful to him. I mean, times are going well for the church in Jerusalem, but they weren't doing the job they were supposed to be doing. They weren't moving out into Judea and to Samaria, and so God brings a little persecution to them, and it made them very uncomfortable. And they got on with the job. But do we really appreciate the grace of God in our life? You know, we, many of us have aches and pains and, and heartaches and things. And yet, do we appreciate that God is still with us? Finally, the last characteristic of Jonah's prayer is that you and I are to acknowledge it's to make an acknowledgement of sacrifice and to making of vows. This involves realization that all sins must be covered by the sacrifice of an innocent, innocent party. And for us as Christians, it's simple. We look back to Christ. He's the innocent party who has made sacrifice for our sins. Somebody, somebody has to pay. For forgiveness. And you and I can't. Because we're not innocent. And we're not eternal. We're not eternally innocent. And so the sacrifice is done through Jesus Christ. But Jonah didn't just stop at sacrifice. He made vows that he would do things. Not so that God would help him out, but because God loved him, because God was his God, because he was grateful for what God has done for him. Not a bargain. Not bargaining to try and fix up his problems or his mistakes. But simply... Because God is God, and we are his people. So we acknowledge that we are unworthy. But we are to also acknowledge that we have a personal commitment for God. That we express as a vow. That as we commit ourselves to being obedient to God, promising to do the very things that we had previously disobeyed, As I said, this is no way of, way like making a deal. 
As I said, Jonah is not saying, if you get me out of this, I'll follow you all the rest of the days of my life. He's saying, I will follow you all the days of my life, whatever, however long that is, because you care for me, because you are my God, because you are the one to do, one whom I must follow. Jonah is saying from inside the, this great fish that he will serve God. Not knowing whether that's it. You know, you know I can get all, all self-righteous and look at, look at Jonah and think, what an idiot. All he had to do was go to Nineveh. And he would have missed out on all of this, this trouble. He would have missed out on shipwreck, well, almost a shipwreck, the great storm. He would have missed out on being swallowed by a fish. And that's me being self-righteous. But me being honest, I can't point the finger at him. Because how many times do you and I act as though we know more than God? How many times do we decide that our wisdom is more important than his wisdom. What are your pray prayers like? No matter whether your prayers are regular or emergency prayers, you ought to have these characteristics in them. Your prayer ought to be honest. Because if you can't be honest with God, who could you be honest with? You ought to be penitent. That is, acknowledging that you do not deserve any good deeds from God. I mean, there's nothing that we, we can have that we deserve. And if we're in that position, then everything we've got ought to make us thankful, ought to make us full of thanksgiving, ought to be making us burst out with Thankfulness that God even bothers to listen, let alone bothers to bless us. And that should lead us to commit to him, to be obedient. No matter what the answer, no matter whether the answer is to my liking or not, we ought to be committed to being obedient to him and committing to uh, ask for forgiveness as soon as we aren't. But Jonah appears to have learned his lesson. Three and four, chapter 3 and 4 are another matter again. Anyway, let us just pray now. O oh, gracious Father, we thank you for your mercy to your servant Jonah. But we thank you for your mercy to us as well. We thank you for your pour, that you pour out your grace upon us, that you fill us with your knowledge, knowledge of you. Help us, O oh Lord, fill us with your spirit that we may seek to live lives that are worthy of the calling to which you have called us. And that we may speak to you in honesty. That we may speak to you in faith. And that we may, O oh Lord, commit regularly ourselves to you. To your obedience, to obedience to you. Because we love you. And because we are grateful to you. We thank you for this, O oh Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.